Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, good evening and welcome to the 2019 Jose Munoz Award Ceremony. I first want to take this opportunity to thank our partner, Karen Sander and Public Programming at the CUNY Graduate Center for annually making this ceremony possible. I also would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Film Studies Program, Psychology Department, and last but not, certainly not least, the Public Science Project. My name is Justin Brown, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, here at the Graduate Center. CLAGS is the oldest university-based research center in the United States, exclusively focused on the socio-cultural, political, and historical concerns of the LGBTQ diaspora. It is our mission to provide a space for impacting social change by creating opportunities for cutting-edge scholarship, education and training, and advocacy. At the center of our work, our programming, which is events such as this, is free and open to the public. As part of our staple programming on an annual basis is this award, the Jose Munoz Award. This award is given in honor of LGBTQ activists who have promoted queer and trans studies and visibility of the community through their work. This award's namesake was not only a prolific writer and academic, but a critical voice for activism and capturing the history of important figures within LGBTQ culture. Furthermore, Jose Esteban Munoz was central to our CLAGS family as a board member and tireless supporter of this organization. Tonight, we are streaming this event. Please share and discuss on social media. You can tweet hashtag CLAGS Munoz 2019. If you'd like to support CLAGS and work similar to events such as this, certainly check out our website, clags.org, for further information. With that aside, tonight we are here to honor Cheryl Dunye. But before introducing Cheryl, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Shanta Sean Smith, who will be leading tonight's conversation. Sean Smith Cruz is an activist, is an archivist, sorry, an activist, <laughs> but archivist at the Lesbian History Archives, assistant professor and head of reference at the Graduate Center Library here at CUNY. Sean has a BS in Queer Women's Studies from the CUNY Bachelor, Bachelor, Bachelor Program, an MFA in Creative Writing and Fiction, and an MLS with a focus on archiving and records management from Queens College. Additionally, in, to, in addition to all of her featured work in journals and anthologies, she also is not only a past person that worked at CLAGS, but now is our board co-chair. <laughs> Cheryl Dunye is a world-renowned African-American director, writer, and actress. She first emerged as part of the queer new wave of young filmmakers in the early 1990s. Her first film feature, The Watermelon Woman, won the Teddy, Art, Teddy Award for Best Feature at the 1996 Berlin International Film Festival. The film is now considered certainly, and I think will always be a classic, and resides in permanent cinema collection here at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Her second feature, HBO's Stranger Inside, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2002 and was nominated for four Independent Spirit Awards, including Best Director. In 2004, she directed My Baby's Daddy for Miramax, which had a budget of $12 million. Her more recent independent features, The Owls and Mommy is Coming, have both screened at top, top tier festivals and garnered a new generation of fans and followers across the globe. Even more recently, she entered a new wave of her career, being not only a director, but now a producing director for episodic television by joining Ava DuVernay and Oprah Winfrey's Queen Sugar. Yeah. But it, of course, does not stop there. Many other episodic directing credits from Claws on TNT, 
the fosters for free form, love is for own, the shy for show, showtime, star for fox, and the list goes on. In 2015, Cheryl's multi-award winning short film, Black is Blue, was named one of the top five must-see feminist films by IndieWire. It is now being developed into a feature film with Laverne Cox attached to the star and the lead. She is also set to adapt and direct a feature based on the novel, The Wonder of All Things for Lionsgate. Many, many other things also coming in in the works. Without further ado, I turn over the conversation to Sean and also again, welcome and thanks to you, Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you so much, Justin. That was a great introduction. Everyone, let's thank Justin for his hard work as I think year three of the CLAG's directorship, right? And we want him to stay on for another three years. So hopefully our applause will do that. Cheryl. Hey. Hey. Yeah. That was like the best moment of my whole year. Okay, all right. I'm a fan, everyone, so I'm going to try not to gush on all over you. And instead, I will do my job and ask, ask questions. <laughs> so Cheryl, yes, yes. welcome back to CLAGS. We've missed you in New York City. Thank you. I mean, New York is a fabulous place in stints, you know, it's kind of great. My, my, you know, part of my fams is here. My, my kids are here and my baby mama, as I, I say, and many other people who are seminal to um, the life that I live, but um, in stints, it's always great. Whereabouts in New York do you like to hang out when you get here? All over, you know. See how she's like not directing? Just, not Bed-Stuy or like Lower East Side? I can't say. I mean, I will go anywhere for the adventure, so. Fair enough. That's, that's that was, that like. was a perfect answer. Yes. All right. <laughs> well, what have you been doing since you've been here? Let us know that. Um, so, uh, my creative uh, partner, Mark Schmalowitz, who's in the audience, wonderful director, he's here, yay, Mark. Um, he did Black is Blue with me and uh, did The Watermelon Woman's 20th anniversary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're working on a ton of projects, but one of them that we're shooting right now is called Pride, and it's a six-part series, a limited series for FX, um, with um, Refinery29 and Killer Films, it's Christine Vachon's uh, company, um, and it's uh, covering and documenting LGBTQ life and activism in the United States of America. Um, it starts in the 1950s and it goes to present day. Um, so there are six parts, so there, you know, it starts in the 50s. And um, I'm one of the directors, there's Yance the Ford, there's Tom Kalin, a variety of people. And what decade did I choose? Anybody want to know? We'll think about it. The 70s, yes, yes, yes. I would say that's definitely like low-hanging fruit for like... Oh, it's amazing because I'm the only director doing um, work who ha is all about women. And the two women that I'm profiling are, yes, Audre Lorde, yes, and Barbara Hammer. All right. So I was here interviewing Flory and Barbara Smith and a ton of other folks and um, we're at the end of our sort of shooting and we'll be posting in LA and it should be out in June 2020. So oh, that's ready for Pride and all the episodes are fabulous and uh, you know it, it's not formally announced so shh. But um, definitely, it's, it's going to be an amazing, amazing thing. So, you know, when it comes in the 70s, now that you mention it, and this wasn't rehearsed, so we'll see how this goes. But Clags did a conference in 2010. It was called Lesbians in the 70s. Or it was uh, Lesbian, no, Amer in America, they call us dykes. Okay. Lesbian yep. Lives in the 70s. I remember because that's when I worked here. Okay. And so, me and like one other person were staff. And there was, we, we put a call out and we asked everyone who was a lesbian in the 70s, like, participate. <laughs> and we created a Google group. And so imagine, like, 70 lesbians who were alive in the 70s, like, emailing each other on Google. It was, like, all ex-girlfriends oh, and, like, goodness. drama. 
Love it. And one of the events that we, so we had a meeting eventually, and the meeting was us in a circle, grad center, basement, and they were like, well, what do we do with the black lesbians? We need lesbians of color. And so then everyone was silent, and some, was Sarah Shulman in the room? Okay, well, she can't correct me. So someone <laughs> in the room said, well, there were no black lesbians in the 70s. They weren't doing oh. anything. And that was my memory. That's what I remembered. I was one of two black lesbians in the room. I wasn't alive in the 70s. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll do an event. And so fast forward that fall in 2010 in spring, the Lesbian Hearst Archives had an event on site, and we called it Black Lesbians in the 70s. Do you remember that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Room full of dykes, lined up, and there was a zine. This is why I'm asking, because you were there. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last time yes, I saw I you in remember. real life. I remember, really, I do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what happened when you, this is like, I'm gonna get back to it, but I have to. Where was it? This was at the Lesbian Hearst Archives, on site, in the Brownstone, in Brooklyn. Like, about. Ten, ten years ago? Nine years ago. I was, I April remember 2010. There. I remember I being together. there. I don't think I was supposed to be there. You weren't but I supposed to be there. There you, you go. See? You kind of <laughs> slide in, I, slid in, I, and we I were was like, just is that Cheryl? <gasps> my, my, the ship just landed, and I got out, and then we, I got back up in the spaceship. I wasn't supposed to be there, but y'all were having No, I was event. so excited. And you know why you were there? Or like why, like the stars aligned? This is my story that I'm like bestowing upon you. Is you were like, well, first of all, you were super dapper, so everybody was trying to flirt with you. And I was like, get out of here, this is my event. I'm gonna get in line in front. And you had on suspenders. Anyhow, not a part of the story. <laughs> the part of the story that's important is you said, hey guys, I'm going to shoot a porno. Oh. What are, what are the other questions here? <laughs> All right, I'll just I did do the porno, yes. I you did. did do it, and you said, yes. do we know of any people? So then we told you that there was this cool play party yes, happening. Yes, 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 okay, Ignacio's I remember exactly, house. yes. Ignacio Rivera, yes, 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 okay. yes. He is a wonderful guy. I remember everything now. <laughs> it's all coming back. The yes. subsequent star of the film. But I was Mom's not home. supposed to be at that event. I know, it was, I, I just it was just serendipity. Sort of da danced yeah. in and danced out. I know. With some information. All right, so that's it. But I, I was at Ima Ignacio's party. I know, because we told you about it. <laughs> Were you there? Yeah, no, I wasn't there. It was oh, a whole then that's thing. another story, right? Okay. All right, so we're going to do... Yes, okay. But I was at the party. <laughs> you were at the party. <laughs> so I don't even know what we're talking... So, <laughs> I made some slides. <laughs> I made some slides, and I pulled them from um, your early works. Okay. And the reason why I was able to do this is because the early works were on Canopy, which the Grad Center no longer can afford. What? I know. It's very unfortunate. NYPL also cannot afford it. And it just happened this year. We're like, this database, which wow. holds both the Watermelon Woman Somebody needs to do something about that in this room. It's so Canopy. expensive. It's, yeah. it's really, and so I have access through Pratt, because I teach there, and so... I was in it, I was like watching the Watermelon Woman again over and over, watching the early works of Cheryl Denier, but then I thought, what is the safer access? So I'm curious to ask you, when it comes to streaming services, like for example, Stranger Inside, like HBO has it, what are they doing with it? If it's on YouTube and we watch it, what does that mean for you as the filmmaker? Nothing, it's on YouTube and I, it's, it's gone. I don't know who put it up, and unfortunately we've been trying for a long time to get uh, YouTube to take it down and to get HBO to sort of deal with that. No executive who was there when I was doing the film is there now. Um, so it sits in the, the vault. Um, I have finally sort of connected with my team now to presently, you know, do something about it, but nobody, it's, you know, Yolanda, all of us are like, what? So it's not on HBO Go, it's not on any of the kind of platforms, you still see it on YouTube. So no aggregation has happened for me because of it, though there is a 35 millimeter beautiful pristine print sitting in their, their vaults. So we, we need to protest and get it out. Um, would be the so thing. do you then think that consumers should be, like for example with music, we know the streaming services have essentially like shut down Virgin Megastore and like they're really, the industry has shifted as a result of streaming and how it works for, for musicians and we kind of all know that. But I know that I'm very 
unknowing about how streaming services work for filmmakers. So how does it work in general? Like, do you prefer things to be? It's, it's gone. I mean, there's nothing I can do in that sense of the way that um, media is streamed right now. There's, it's, you know, viral, buck wild. Nobody is caring, doing. It's global. You can't really control that. So I can go to the source and try to do things on that, that end, but literally, you know, I, I'm happy, in particular with that film, uh, it's about women in prison, and I really want them to have access to. So I think that's more important with that topic. So it really needs to be free, and it needs to be out there in the biggest way. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. That's fair enough. Free or accessible. Right, exactly. Not behind the vault. Not behind the vault, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's see what else I have on the slide. Oh, your bag of tricks here. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Oh. This, this is what I was sort of like having dreams about because when I think of Cheryl Denier's film, I think of this chair. And I just learned that it's an actual chair. It's an actual chair. It's still in our house. Karina and I have been moving it around many places, trying to, it doesn't fit in with everything, but it actually does. So um, I'm thinking about donating it to an archive, really. Uh, I think it's a, it was a beautiful chair when I got it at the thrift store, so hey, <laughs> it's, it's an important chair. It's an important chair because it represents your aesthetic of having a voice and having an absence of voice all at once and also being autobiographical, but then also creating a character. I think it just, if I see this screen, I immediately think Cheryl Denier. So my other questions, I have to read them so I don't go off the cuff too much. The genumentary. Mm. There it goes. So Alexander Juhas, who's sitting right in front of me, and I'm going to pretend not to notice wrote an article uh, for Minnesota Press in 1997 in her publication, or part of a publication called Women in Vision, Histories in Feminist Film and Video. And it was an interview with you. And so 1997 was one year after The Watermelon Woman was put out into the world. And she remarked on your introductory style of the genumentary. Is that how you would say it? Dunier, yes, Dunier, Dunier, Dunier The mentory part is important. Yes. <laughs> and it's a hybrid of narrative, documentary, comedy, and autobiography. And by then you said you made five videos in one film. So do you still see your work as a part of the Dunumentary tradition? And tell us more about the stylistic and political choices of the Dunumentary. Uh, that's an amazing question, because it's something that I think about all the time. How can I insert that? Um, in the episodic at work I'm doing. Unfortunately, the episodic shows like Claws, like, you know, every, I just did, um, uh, I'll be doing All Rise. I mean, there's no way to kind of, yeah, y'all gonna have a Dunumentary episode. I mean, there's nothing I can do about the formula that producers and showrunners already have set up. They're bringing me in for other reasons. They're not bringing me in to change that, and that's not what you do as a di director of episodic. But in my own work, I have incorporated that many ways um, within the concept of Black is Blue as a short. Kings and Faraday's here, who was in you know the the chair basically, and you know spoke about it. Um, I use it as a creative source to play with you know what people think about themselves as characters and the interview, uh, interviewing them about who they are, you know. So I have this conversation and I record it and then I get a lot of juice. I, I do that during the process of production and then I do that when we're doing post and to fill the holes that I need. So I'd love to kind of continue playing with it and I know other people used it. It's something I got from, you know, filmmakers prior to myself. David Holtzman's Diary is one by Jim McBride and, um, Godard, you know, tons of people have used this kind of format of sitting and talking to the camera and, and, and pretending to have an interview um, or pretending to be real, but I, I haven't inserted it as much as I could um, in, in, uh, in the episodic work that I'm doing now because that's all I'm doing really right now. I'm going to fast forward because now I have a question about gesture. So I wanted to bring in Jose Munoz oh. a bit into the room. Actually, you said that you've, you've known you know, Munoz. Oh, yes, Tell yes. Tell me about your Jose story Jose, before I ask the question. Oh, uh, so many stories. I mean, 
coming out of grad school, I went to Rutgers in New Brunswick. Hey, Mason Grove School of the Arts, any Rutgers people? No. Damn. Okay. All right. Um, so I went to Rutgers Mason Gross School of the Arts for my MFA. And um, after I finished that program, a two-year uh, program in the arts, I had a studio practice. I was you know, doing a little art in the studio and making these little projects of, of sort. Um, I ended up moving to New York. And at that same time uh, was sort of the birth. It was, you know, the culture wars had started. Go Fish, uh, Christ, uh, 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 Gwen Turner and Rose Troche had just moved here, and Rose and Gwen are, were very good friends with Jose, and so we all would gather and hang out, um, and Jose just had gotten the job at um, NYU. So every Sunday we would all do things, you know, whatever, and watch The Simpsons, which was actually new at the time, and just do that regularly on Sundays, um, beyond just being in our own cultural circles and hanging out. So Jose was a really good friend early on. We did many, many of things um, that were really fun and really uh, had lots of conversations about, you know, off-the-cuff conversations about many of the things that he wrote about and meeting all the performance artists that he talked about, Badge Davis and you know, just everybody was sort of, it's like a love fest that we were having or we were just being who we were. There was no, you know, borders around any of that, you know, that time because we were all in the margins. So there was sort of like the queer culture that was being created and really pretty and consumed and, you know, in the galleries and written about and talked about. And then there, were, there was us kind of on the sidelines of color, young academics, artists who were just, you know, funking it up. Um, and we were just, you know, two broke, you know, rice and beans at, you know, I don't know, the, the hat or wherever it was. I don't know what we were doing, but we were just really poor and wanted to entertain ourselves and wanted to like have conversations. So Jose, we do that you know, tons of times. And then throughout the years as Jose, you know, moved through his, you know, oeuvre and I did as well, um, we'd drop in and see each other. I mean, but coastal changes and, you know, career changes really affected everyone, but we definitely would, you know, keep in touch. I think the last time I saw Jose was at his 40th birthday party and it was in LA um, and it was a reunion of all the same folks I was talking about, Shari Frilo and um, Rose and Gwen and, and, and tons of people and that was an amazing moment. I hadn't seen him for a long time and I think everybody had these little Jose masks on. I don't know if the masks were created. And he was still the same. He was the sa same little, like, you know, laughing, snidely type of guy and, you know, dissing everybody and, like, let's go and, you know, let's go to the bathroom and hang out and, you know, <laughs> do different things. I won't even say, you know, just being totally, you know. I think the margins, and, and, and we all understood this, from our foremothers and forefathers in the, in the queer canon um, are, are exciting places to be, um, are the places where we can be free and you know, talk about what we want to and um, make mistakes and you know, kiki and you know, do whatever we want to. And so those margins were those places where um, we all lived all of color, you know, there was no hierarchy and, and that's where we learned and that's where we were open to it and, and, you know, we weren't as embarrassed as we would have been, you know, at the, at the event. We were like, we couldn't get to the event or we were late to the event and so we would all, you know, gather around the event and I think that's where all of our kind of cultural production came about, you know, some people were in the event, of course, but you know, definitely, that's where we, you know, gained our our fodder and our criticism. Um, our analysis came from really reading the event, like reading. We read to learn, and we read to read, and we read to read harder, um, and and to be and show up. So Jose really taught me about. Um, I mean, we would just joke. I mean, he taught me a, a, about the sort of, um, you know, how to have uh, playfulness with the academy and playfulness with you know, the sacred queer, you know, subjectivity, objectivity, and, and creativity that was happening. Um, and, and so I dearly, you know, miss him and think about him all the time. Um, and so I'm so honored to be, you know, receiving this award. Oh, thank you for that ode. <laughs> 
You know, one part of um, Jose's work that I read was in a 2007 article where he was reviewing Amiri Baraka's uh, The Toilet, which is a play that he did. And he brought up the concept of queer futurity. And it, it, rung, it struck a chord for me because a lot of the work I do is archival and it's about the past, right? So it's like 1970s, what happened then? But when thinking of performance, Jose really thought of the present and like you just described, like learning how to be fully present and coexisting with people. And then the future, looking toward the future through the present. And so one quote that, he, that I pulled was he says, queerness should and could be about a desire for another way of being in both the world and time. A desire that resists mandates to accept that which is not enough. So with his passing and this current award and us honoring his legacy, but also not getting stuck in the past and looking forward, tell us how you think about how your work has changed over time. Mm. And how do you apply expectations of the future to your work? Mm, mm. Well, that's another wonderful, deep question. Um, I definitely feel, you know, the term, and I always say this is like black to the future, you know. So it's really about, you know, it is. It's just like about this ability to, you know, have the knowledge of the past, but to put it into a kind of a future context of activism and use it. Um, and then to project what the world could be and should be, and to constantly be in that you know river, you know running downstream, upstream, downstream, upstream, and downstream, but doing that work, you have to go back and forth. Um, but you have to have that knowledge and, and that depth to be able to you know do something with the future. Um, so I I feel that um, the future is the future is in in us now. You know we are the future. We are our own futures. Um, and we have to do something with it, or we'll just stay, stay, you know. Life is a, you know, a, a process and not a state. And I think so many of us kind of get caught in this moment, but we're the only change factors to grab the future and go beyond that. So I really do believe about what queer of color human futures are about and, and how I, you know, want to contribute to that, you know, by creating now, which will become a past, but by being a part of my own future, which I have no idea what it's about. You know, I, I just know how to do my work as the past, Audre Lorde said, and, you know, as a future that I continue to make. So it's just, it's, a, it's like an ebb and flow, a, a flux, um, and you, you know, you just wake up one day at, with gray hair and I wear a hat they're gonna have to wear and, you know, whatever, all, and, and older, wiser, but still wanting to, you know, have another life and have another future. So um, I constantly am trying to not hold on to too much so I can, you know, pivot myself to wherever I need to be. Good? Someone said Thank that was you. very good. That's exactly, <laughs> that's all I can do. I have no idea. And watching you answer that question has me thinking about the gesture like this, because you're just Do like, I do that? Do I? Oh, it's shoot. wonderful, right? But it, you also do it in your films. Something that I always pay attention to when you're watching, so now I'll go to the next one. Ooh, whoa. This thing. Bam. Yes. Munoz also says, he focuses on the gesture. He says that the gesture interrupts the normative flow of time and movement. And, I, and just to like pull out from that a bit, and I'm watching your early works, which were part of um, Dancing Girl Productions, is that what it was called? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just I, even the, the title of that dancing, right? That you, even in a present moment, you use the genre film to express movement in a way that is about future expectation or onward looking, like there's, a, there's, there's no still in your film. There's always a, an expectation of movement. So if you haven't seen, like a, I mean you could take a frame, right? And, or frame is still, but a moment. And there's hands rubbing each other, like someone's hands rubbing on themselves, or someone's, the side of their face, but they're looking in a direction. And just those close-ups, make us look at the gesture of the person. People's feet on the ground yeah. kind of Feet dancing. are important, I love feet, because you can't really tell gender, race, class, who anybody is by their feet. So if you just see feet, 
you know, Simone, my, my kids look at me laughing, um, but uh, definitely is about, it, it's, it, it's the most, you know, liberated, element of who we are is our, our feet in shoes. And yet shoes. we use them to walk. In shoes, I would say. <laughs> we use <laughs> them so to sorry. walk forward. It has to have shoes on them because it also tells about who you are. What, but, you know, never mind. Yeah, there's political implication with shoes and feet. So my question was, how do you, pro how do you, <laughs> how do you project elements of desire um, through the passage of time and the gesture in your queer subjects? Tell us how... Uh, the idea of queer subjects, desire, and gesture has reflected in your work and how you see it evolving into a queer future. It's, it's bad that I wrote these down, right? Cause Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? Yes. <laughs> I'll give you an example, and let's see. Okay, black is blue. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking because you're right in front of me, and I can't, I can't yeah, unsee you now. Yes, yes. Kingston Parody, everybody, the, the star, star of Black is Blue Black is right is here. Blue. Yes, yes. In the room. Praise be. And so there is, I feel like it's somewhat Afrofuturistic, right? Yes. And there's desire embedded in it because it's about love, like a connecting love story or an unlove story or a re-love story. So how do you consider the full story in the, the special, mo the specific moments as you're shooting? You know, I guess, you know, with cinema, with film, with directing, with writing, you have to, uh, screenplays and, and stories. But can you describe Black is Blue for the audience? Oh, Black is Blue um, is about um, uh, an African-American uh, trans man who is living on the streets of Oakland um, in his car, and he is trying to figure out who he is and you know what his day to day is. Um, he is a security guard at a uh, apartment building, and he runs into uh, a lover that he had when he was a, a woman. And the story begins there. And I'll just say that um, it's a short. It uh, won several awards. Um, we're working on making it into a feature. Uh, and in, in doing that, we have reinvested and, and really put more Afrofuturistic stuff in it, as well as going back to the past and looking at um, Sunset Boulevard, uh, which is one of my favorite films. So I, you know, I ground in the past and, and then project it to the future. So um, it becomes a play about um, a, a, a black trans man, a black trans woman, and an android. Um, for the future story, uh, the future. Um, so, desire is about you know the future should have no gender. The future should have race should be kind of interesting in the future too. And I mean, with film and video, with performance, with any kind of media art, you have the ability to make the world the way you want it to be. You don't have to write about the present. Um, those sort of dramas sort of weigh us down you have the ability to go anywhere and make any people who they are and represent what you want and what you don't want. And so many people sort of limit themselves into talking about the past or talking about the present and being, you know, really about talking about truth. And um, truth is what you want it to be, you know. You're your own truth, you're spelling your own truth. So, you know, my work in, in kind of concepts of desire is really positing the desire that I want to be in the world, positing the, you know, queer and trans and, you know, POC bodies, you know, any kind of things that I want, I have to put them in the world or they won't be there. So that really is about what my project is in my work. Yes, it is. I think that's a perfect segue into the watermelon women, wouldn't you say? Ooh. Oh, well, now this is just another cameo of Cheryl's face. Okay. Why not? Because I needed to, like, get to the next one. Oh, oh, wait. Yes, the watermelon woman. So, of course, I think that you just described the watermelon woman really well in that description of your full work. Okay. All right. uh, but it seems like that's the work that we know that it's done, and this is, this, this is why I had the slide, because this is supposed to be a surprise slide. <laughs> okay, all right. Bam, but now you're not surprised. <laughs> clit. Um, but before we get to the clit, let's get to, let's do some foreplay. So, 
what is going on? <laughs> this is why Justin is not in the seat. All right. <laughs> She's frightened. Okay. <laughs> How do I begin? Firstly, I teach graduate students in library science, and we have to go over the watermelon woman. And, and we use specifically like Alana Cumbier's article that references um, the archive specifically of the watermelon woman. But it's everywhere. You know, you go into any field of study. The English department had a huge event the other day where the watermelon woman was featured um, in every university probably across the globe. So you've just, you've done it. I, I, it amazes me that, that, that this little idea that lives on to talk about so many different things, in particular the archive and in particular library science. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. Every I love libraries, so go on. The world. Go well, I on. think you've created us. You know, you sort of, well, that's probably too much to say. Well, you created me. I'll just put it out there. Ooh, and that. seriously. Right. Let's and part, that. Let's yes. That. Thank you, my mother, my, my ancestral mother. Um, and part of the reason I could say that it's because of the specific scene. I saw the word of my own woman when I was 16, and I thought that it was real for many, many years thereafter. And, you know, there's a line at the end, but who reads at 16? You're not reading the, the line. <laughs> so you're just like, this is amazing. I want to go, I want to go on and forge this fight and create our history. And then I go to a place that felt similarly connected to the place in the <laughs> film, and it was the Lesbian Hearst Archives. And so now I'm going to read from what I had written down, because it's a serious question. <laughs> so there, rumors have had it that you actually did steal material from the Lesbian Hearst Archives. <laughs> Um, and others contend that you were aiming to discredit the Lesbian Hearst Archives. What I would say, actually, and similar to what Kumbier what says in her article, <laughs> is that your depiction of the, set, the Center for Lesbian Information Technology reminds us that grassroots archives are not exempt from the repercussions of power relations. And I think that that's really... true. The element that you there. pull from we can it. Go there, yes, right. that's we can the, start that's there the too. serious part. When I read that question, when you like sent it to me and stuff, like I was like, "What?" I got so upset. I was like, you know, talking to everybody around me, like, oh, what's, no. she talking? "What's going on?" Um, the way the Waterbound Woman was, you know, written, it was written as a script, da da da, and then all the people who were playing themselves or wanted to play characters like Sarah Shulman, like even Camille, I said, "Do what you want to do." follow kind of these beats and let's have fun. So all that, that happened there was really Sarah just, you know, I didn't know she was going to dump that thing. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was some stuff written for her to say, but yeah. really it was just about, you know, I, I, I think it was about the process, too, of making the film that really was... Um, why the archive was this challenging place. I did actually go to the Lesbian Hearst Archives, didn't steal anything, um, met Joan, you know, learned about a lot of people, Ira Jeffries, tons of people um, I learned about, and, and my search was fulfilled. So I wanted, but it took me a while to figure it out, you know, it really took me a while to kind of see myself um, and understand where I came from and wanting to put that long, you know, process into, you know, celluloid, which is, you know, it's in celluloid, um, down into this project because it's not always found for other people. But people yearn to figure out who they are. And, and you know, I had to really kind of put that in the film. To take something, I only took it in the film, but not necessarily in, in real life um, because we shot the film in... Not on site, yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was not at... An, it was in the... You know, to make the... To use the Philadelphia Public Library location well, they allowed us to kind of shoot in a room in the basement and they had some books stacked up and we sort of used a table and pretended it was the archive, so... So, to put the rumors to rest, Cheryl Denier did not steal... There we go. ...the Lesbian Hearst oh. Archives. You've heard it here. But I will say that since, I don't know if it's because of the making of that film, but there were definitely, you know, the lesbian, in New York City, there was this also Soul Sisters, which yes. was around in the 1970s. And Georgia Brooks, who was one of the coordinators, did help to put a lot of the black lesbian material in LHA. But since your film, there had been a resurgence of invisibility expectation that has come to the archives. And I think that in some ways it's a gift because people have come 
with the insistence of making sure that there were black lesbian material in the co thank you. collection. So thank you for your attention to this special space. I so believe in archives. I think everybody here should be, you know, thinking about their own archive, should be documenting themselves. I mean, it's both subjects that I am I'm shooting on, Audre Lorde and Barbara Hammer, kept fantabulous archives. We went to the Audre Lorde archive at uh, Spelman and her wedding dress is there beyond her dreads, you know, everything. I mean, everything uh, is archivable. Everything speaks about who you were beyond your journals and sort of writing and your, you know, what you think might be archivable. Everything, I mean, don't throw anything away, you know. I mean, I, I don't, you know. Especially not the I'm chair. I'm forced to throw things away. I regret throwing things away. Like, that shirt, I can't. And, and the thing is, I threw it away and now it's back, you know. It's like, wow, damn. Um, it's like, you know, back in fashion, like a lot of the stuff that I kind of got rid of, but you are the most important person in the whole wide world, and um, you should be remembered. You should figure out where to, you know, archive your stuff. You should you have really a place in mind where you're going to send your um, I started to give my stuff to the One Institute in, um, uh, at USC. Um, yes, the One Institute. They're, they're a great archive. Uh, some stuff is at the Schomburg as well. Um, and there's, you know, things to scatter around, you know, I want to be known everywhere, so a little bit of, make it, make it difficult for people to find, you know, well, get the big grant if they had to go do my, you know, a paper on the water, Germany, New Zealand, you know, Mars, you know, try to make it hard, make it hard for people, and, and you get that fellowship. I want to write about Cheryl Dunier, and can I have the Mars scholarship, you know, yes, yes. Are there any people in the room that have, were a part of the making of the Watermelon Woman? I'm just curious. Yes. Give me your hand. Watermelon Woman, please stand up. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Two folks in no. the house. Brent Hill, who played the Watermelon Woman's, uh, or. Uh, I know. I thought there would be a hand. Yep. He was in the photos as well as he played. Um, uh, Jay Liberty Hill, the black uh, producer who produced the Word of My Woman's film, and Mark Schmolowitz, who um, did the 20th anniversary uh, restoration of the film, and Alexandria Huas, Alexander who played uh, um, Martha, you know, the Word of My Woman's partner and lover, and produced the film with me, and, uh, you know. Martha Page. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, there's, that's, that's, that's a significant part of the film right there. So I, I thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for your hard work. Yes. Yeah. I'm like almost running out of time. Oh my goodness. Really? Because oh I want to open up the floor to audience questions. And I was going to ask about some, um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I was going to ask about ancestral connection since we think about archives and we think about um, our past. But instead, I'm going to ask you about your current work <laughs> because I know everybody's <laughs> okay. excited right, about sure. Queen Sugar. And there's also a potential Lionsgate situation happening, right, a film right. with Lionsgate that we want to hear more about. And we want every people in the room who have their portfolios because they want to work for you and like be one of your next actors will need to know how they can like be that person. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the people. Oh, so the okay. tell us about what you're working on sure, right sure. now. Sure, sure. So I, I, did, I did top this off with talking about the FX series, Pride. Um, uh, but I think one of the wonderful acquisitions that Mark and I have just worked on um, is uh, acquiring the IP, intellectual property that is, the rights to Joel Gomez's The Gilda Stories. <laughs> Talk about Black to the Future. Um, so we are um, turning that into a series. And um, we're, you know, in the next year or so, you know, start to kind of pull it together with, you know, I mean, what a wonderful process. That's every amazing. year for the last, I don't know, 10 years, every time I saw Jewel, I would say, Jewel, I want, I want that book. I want to make a film. I want to make whatever. And she was like, no, no, I'm just, you know, working on book two and da 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 da. And then I think she saw The Handmaid's Tale. Uh. And she was like, do 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 do. Cheryl, uh, can we have lunch? <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm, what's up? Um, and so, literally, it was, you know, I, I think 
seeing the, you know, being able to see what can happen with great works, um, and, and especially the place of that work as, as it, it being so important for what we're all talking about now, the future and the past and the kind of the line between them about, you know, how to really talk about these historical moments where we were invisible and need to be visible and, you know, are doing our work on the margins and the center. This, everything was in it. So um, we're, we're working on that right now and um, it should be very soon that things are gonna, you know, be talked about about that. Um, I am also working on a screenplay that I wrote turning that into an episodic called Adventures in the 419 about a Nigerian scam artist. Um, you know, the 419 emails and texts, and I guess there were faxes that people would get, right? That said, dear sir, madam, my name is Abubu, and I, you know, I'm a princess and whatnot. So I wrote a screenplay about that when I was living abroad in Amsterdam, and then I kind of let that rest, but it's so vital right now. Um, to talk, and I, I'm resetting that in the Silicon Valley, um, to talk about all the brown and black and queer people who are not in, allowed to be in tech. The only way that they're in tech is, is as cleaners. So um, as cleaners, as bus drivers, as you know, janitorial. So these are the people who are like, hey, let's scam these folks, right? So they're running some major scam, and it's the, you know, a lot of you know, fun stuff in that. Um, and... Uh, I, you know, just working on, doing a lot of writing and, you know, on the episodic realm, just working on a lot of different shows. I just did David Makes Man. I don't know if I read David Makes Man. Um, the last three episodes of that, um, I did the season of, produced the season of, season four of um, uh, Queen Sugar. Um, yeah. A, 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 thank you. That was great. Episode 10, which was the one really about, um, Looking at trauma when uh, Darla, you know, had her slip, was the episode that I did, which was you know really moving and hard to kind of deal with that. Um, I'm also I just did an episode of All Rise. I don't know. Uh, 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 oh, we'll be doing that next next week. Um, but um, Sacred Lies Two. I don't know if anybody knows what Sacred Lies is. Anybody ever hear of it? Because it's like well, I never heard of it either. And I was like, what? It's on Facebook. Facebook Watch, and I was like, Facebook has shows. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll do it, sure. But um, it's a, a wonderful story. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, so that's free on Facebook for the world, which I thought was really interesting to think about this platform and shows, and they're going to put a lot of attention into that. Um, just, you know, lots of little things. And then you also sleep, right? Yes, <laughs> try to sleep, a little bit of sleep. Well, I, I think it's two minutes over time for me to open it up to the floor. So I think what that means is that the lights are going to come up and then people are going to walk to the microphones and ask Cheryl questions. And you can, we'll sort of alternate. Don't be scared. Yay. All right. Yeah, yeah. I love it when, well, go ahead. I'll let you speak. Um, is this thing on? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being in space with me and everyone else. Yeah. Um, thank you, Cheryl. Yes. I appreciate you. Um, I worked with you on production for Black is Blue. Yes, yes. And um, I just, my question is about the past and wondering who you were as a creative child and what you'd like to get into back in the day. I got into trouble. <laughs> this is young, youngin. Uh, as a creative person, I, I really was about, I, I, you know, I, I think of the only way I could think about this is being playful and, you know, being not allowed to play. You know, I think as a young person, um, I was I was a latchkey kid, whatever that might mean, which means I had a working parent or parents. I had one parent, uh, my mom, who was around most of the time, and my father sort of trickled back in and out of my life as I, um, you know, grew up. But that allowed me a lot of time to create my own reality um, and also engage with media and, and any kind of media that I wanted to. So there was, I was not, there was not a lot of stuff that was prohibited from my reach. Uh, there wasn't, you know, locks on, you know, online and you couldn't do this or that. I mean, you could do anything as a kid back in the 70s, really. So I, my reach was far and wide. 
So I really kind of created my own Cheryl. Um, it's interesting because there was a question of the um, producers of this 70s documentary I'm doing. And they're like, why did you pick Audrey? Why did you pick, you know, um, Barbara? You know, did you know them in the 70s? Did you know anything that was going on in the 70s? I said, no. I did not know a damn thing that was going on in the 70s other than what I wanted to be. You know, I was never in the closet. I was always out, but I was always engaging with the world and, and really trying to um, get a sense of who, you know, who I was, um, wh why did I like women <laughs> and what that was about and where I could kind of figure that out and how to engage with that. Um, so I just kind of just kept alive. I didn't really have... I wasn't, there weren't, weren't a lot of kind of restrictive things that were happening to, to uh, what I wanted to do, except for in the private girls Catholic Academy where I was at school, which was the big, you know, the big nun hand um, that sort of stopped things. But, you know, it didn't stop too much, right? <laughs> I'm right here. I'm right here. Here. That could have been where the desire question started. Probably. We'll talk about that later in the next interview. Are there any filmmakers in the room that have a question for Cheryl? Oh, there's another person. Hello. Hello. My name is Darnell Casimir. Hi, Darnell. Um, hi. Thank you so much for being here. I really enjoyed this. So I write myself, and while I have not directed anything, I saw on Hollywood Reporter, um, there were, it was Tracy Ellis Ross, Melina Matsukis, there were some other people on it and they were talking about women directing and then Tracy Ellis Ross and Melina Matsugas were talking about their perspective as black women and how I think there's 2% of women, black women that are directing and I'm sure it's probably significantly less for women LGBTQ in that sphere. But what I've been seeing working in production just in the PA capacity is how much gatekeeping there is in the industry. Yes. And it's like, you hear the statistics but to actually see it is like, very scary and it's quite unsettling. So considering you're considering that you are considered a pioneer from the 90s and present day, I just watched an episode of David Makes Man literally before I got here. I almost missed my train. Great show, awesome job. Um, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, considering there is so much gatekeeping, how do we how do we actually break those barriers down? People are like, just keep breaking it down, but it's like, how do I even get the hammer in my hand to actually break the door down? And what does the future look like for women to be directing, to be writing, executive producing? That's a wonderful question and a wonderful thing that we have to do. Um, so I'm on a mission and I was, I've always been in my work um, having interns, bringing younger people in, bringing people who don't have the ability or the skills to do anything to, you know, work on the job. It's not about what you do in the classroom, really. I mean, you can get your degrees that d does help you get to a certain point, but you really have to be sort of ushered into a position. And that's how every, you know, white boy, girl, whatever is in, th that's how Hollywood is run, right? It's always like, oh, no, I got, you know, my... John's son, you know, Jake, is going to run that department. And literally, I was talking to a white woman DP that I just worked with, and she had hired a whole bunch of women of color to work on her crew. And um, the producer said, oh, my son and his friends are going to come and take this position. You have to fire them. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, it was really hard, and I had, like, women of color, and I was doing all the right things, but here's this guy who was this white producer and wanted his son and his friends to take the jobs, and so he had, she had to fire them. And that's what happens today. No, nothing about what we're reading about, about everybody flipping and changing. And so you really have to practice what you preach. I mean, Ava did a wonderful thing by allowing and continuing to allow only women to direct Queen Sugar. Um, and that's how we all broke in or break, you know, I, my season, I'm trying to think of who was there. Um, uh, there's myself, there was Aurora Guerrero, C. Fitz is the season, uh, the season that I worked with. So um, uh, even, um, hmm? Julie was in my season. Yes, it was. Julie was in my season, right? So Ayuk and Chinzera was in last season and this season. I mean, people from the way, way back who just don't get the opportunity to work in television. Um, so you have to create the opportunity if you have the ability to do that. And that's one model that Ava's doing. They call it the Ava effect, um, which really makes changes the world. So 
I did that with, prior to the Ava effect, I did that with Stranger Inside, where all the keys in my film were women or people of color, uh, or, or trans, or, or, or queer. And so I wanna continue to do that in my episodic work. And I also wanna, I, I think that there's, and, and Mark and I have been talking about this, and we're gonna try to talk to the people about this, that there is no really you know, one sort of training program right now or mentorship program that works with LGBTQ people of color to get them into positions. Um, and not just like, oh, let me train you outside and you get a little degree and good luck, but get you on the floor, into the writer rooms, shadowing, um, you know, really there, you know, because that's where it happens. So we're trying to kind of conjure up a way to talk to some of the studios about that and see if they will, you know, really take this bait, you know, and say, look, every year you get this thing that says there's no Latinx, there's no this or that. Here we are, we're gonna help people. We're gonna train them, we're gonna do a 50-50 program, or we're gonna flip the room, we're gonna do whatever we can. And we've been doing this in our lives, you know, you just haven't seen it. Um, you just don't even know about it. The FX executive, I, I'm not gonna say their name, but when I said, I pitched what I was gonna do in the 70s and who I wanted to profile, I said, Audrey Lord, you hear? Oh, Audrey Lord. Very interesting, I've never heard of her before. I was like, have my money, show me what you, I mean, I was like, no friggin' way. You have not heard of Audrey Lord? And this is a very powerful white woman, executive producer of a studio. I was like, all right, I'm done. I am done, I am done. So it's, you know, luckily I'm at this, you know, front line at this moment and I'm gonna do what I can. And so thank you for bringing that up and thank you for saying your name. Yeah. Um, it's, it's uh, what do you say that? I'm at Cheryl Dunier on Insta. So if you want, is it there? Oh, there, um, okay. All that too. Um, so just really be in contact. And I really do try to put folks, I mean, the, we made the Watermelon Woman, Alexandra and I, and Mark and I worked that way. And, you know, we worked on the, all my projects, I just bring po folks in. So let's just stay in touch and, and the moment will happen. I will speak with you after then. Oh, <laughs> okay. Mm, mm, mm. I think we have time for one more. Hi, I'm Nancy Vasquez. I'm an indie filmmaker. Hi, Nancy. And sure, I was so looking forward to um, just hearing you speak and meeting you and uh, just you discussing your work. I've been following you for a, a very long time. Um, in fact, I, I love that one of your, uh, one of the people you follow or admire is uh, Chantel Ackerman. Ah, uh, yes, yep, She's yep. incredible, hands down. Um, um, I was able to get one of my films into Amazon Prime, and that was difficult. And then I'm having, you know, just a slight bit of trouble getting my film out now. Thank God it's, it's making the um, film festival market, uh, Moth, Matters of the Heart. But how do you, how are you able to get your films out without an A-list actor? I mean, they focus so much on that, and I wish that that wasn't the focus, but it is. Well, it's starting to flip a little bit, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm saying. You're starting to see a little bit of people, uh, people are looking for fresh new talent, yes. straight up. That's, I mean, if you look at the show like David Makes Man, right. I don't, the only, Felicia Rashad was the only person that I knew that was like, we had to go like Miss Felicia, right. um, or Felicia, actually it is, I got corrected, you know, it's not, I, I, it's, no, next time you meet her. Um, and. <laughs> <laughs> really, because I was like, oops, you know. Um, so it's not even about that anymore. It's actually having the great idea, you know, something that really is, you know, having a little bit of a, a track record, of some visibility. So just get your work out there as you, you're, you're doing the right okay. thing. Um, but really just showing up. Showing up not where you should be, but where you're supposed to be, you know. And I think that people don't do that. Like, I, I want to be a director, I'm supposed to be a director, where do I go as a director? Well, I'm gonna go to the DGA where directors go and just show up, just show up. Like, I'm gonna go, what, when they're having a meeting, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be at all the places that they, I'm supposed to be, you know, and, 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 and should be. And once you start being there, people are like, wow, and, and answering, asking these questions and, and seeing the, the players and how they play or at the film festivals or whatever, go. 
in, in, the most important thing for me was going to film festivals. Actually, the most important film festival I think I went to was the Berlin Film Festival, where we got the award. It was like, wow, we are so tiny in our conversations about activism and film and art and culture, and there's a whole world of people you'll find your place in the world. You might not find your place in the United States of America, okay. but you'll find your place in the world. So you have to show up in the world where you want to be, not just in this, you know, small, tired, you know, defensive, hard ass, capitalistic, I won't even go down the list of things when it needs to be. We don't have, you know, this is like, this is chipping us away. But the world is such a, you know, a beautiful, challenging, disturbing, conflictory space that, that needs us to show up. So show up in the world the, the way that you want to be and go to those film, world festivals, not okay. just here. Fuck, excuse my French. <laughs> you know, it's important to lay some groundwork here, but it's very important to go abroad and, and go where you are an ambassador and you'll feel like it. And once you start feeling like it, it, it it'll change for you. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, this will be our final question. Hi. Hi. I'm Al. I use they them pronouns. I go to Sarah Lawrence College, so I met Gwen Turner. It was very strange. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh. Why was that? Um, because we have like this interview process for classes, and she stopped in the middle of my interview to smell her hands because she was using this like hand sanitizer. She was like, "You have to smell this." So then I smelled the hand sanitizer. And then we, you know, it was just very strange. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go there, but I could. Yeah, yes. um, but my question is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> did it smell good? It did, but like not good enough to pause the interview. <laughs> but my question is, um, thinking about how What's remarkable about the photograph and film is that it's not only a model, like a snapshot in time of something that existed, but also something that we can project our thoughts onto and so, sort of like a vision for what we want in the world. And thinking about films like Watermelon Woman, which for a lot of people is maybe the first time they're seeing a black lesbian and black queer women on film, I just wanted to know like, what your thoughts were about what you hope your images and films create as far as visions and futures for black queer people. Yes, um, I, 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 that's, everything you said is amazing and I'm like still reeling in this, I'm smelling, trying to smell. Um, I think what I'm trying to create and why I'm working and working and constantly working is to make it just normal to see black, queer, brown, trans, anything, to make us all like a normal part of the spectrum. Um, that when you, you know, oh, there's this and that, like, oh, I, I, Superman, 17, blah, blah, blah. Oh, there's this black, queer, trans, new, you know, part two. Oh, I wanna go see that. Yeah, let's all go see that, action film. I wanna make that uh, an option in, in, this, in the selection process. Right now, it's all this like, oh, the special festival. Ooh, over here, oh, the specialty cinema. Oh, this and that. I think it's just be a part of our choices. And it's, it's, it's it, I don't know, I think we all need to kinda I, continue to just make work. That's number one. Um, and number two, I think the concept of our allies need to kind of be, uh, we need to be a little bit more rough on our allies because I think they are our allies, but they, some of them need to just like take a vacation or go or like end their allyship and allow <laughs> other people to come in. I really do. I'm sorry. It's like, you know what? You've been running that film festival for 25 years, boo. Just step aside, it's all right, let somebody else run it, you know? And, and for example, Sarah Shulman, I know when it was the New York Lesbian Gay Film Festival, stepped aside, knew she had to, and let Shari Frilo start it and call it the, you know, uh, the new festival. Um, and people just need to know that their time is out, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. The queen is dead, long live the queen. The they is dead, long live the they. You know what I'm saying? Like, change it up. So I think, uh, it's very hard for people to let go of their power. I mean, that's why Hollywood and the white male factor in Hollywood looks the way it does. I mean, Rambo 17 or whatever they're probably gonna do. I mean, what? 
You know, it's very hard for these guys to let let it go. Um, but so, you know, I'm you know I'm I'm just doing what I can do. But in in our small ways, in the in our small networks, if there's a way to kind of work with Gwen Turner and tell her to put down the lotion or give it to you <laughs> and say, you know what, I'm going to work that um, sanitizer now, excuse me. <laughs> and it has the butters in it. I got some shea butter in it. So, you know, <laughs> step aside. Step aside, Gwen. Shea butter is the way. You know what I'm saying? It's like, whatever. I'm sorry. Thank you. Everyone, please, let's give a round of applause for Cheryl Dernier. Ah, thank you so much. The next phase of the moment is that we're actually going to give Cheryl her Jose Esteban Jose. Munoz Award. Jose. And take photos. So what does it say, Justin? So um, the Center for LGBTQ Studies, CLAGS, the Jose Munoz Award 2019 is presented to Cheryl Dunier for significant contributions to LGBTQ advocacy. Oh. a few words as I have written very few words I mean there are very few words here um, you know I want to thank Justin and Shanta and I want to thank my assistant Saba who's not here but did a lot of work and, and Jimmy and all the people at CLAGS who who pulled this together um, uh, Lisa Marie Bronson wherever she is uh, she said she might be here but she uh, was the watermelon woman and I think that was a significant part of of, of playing somebody so significant to our history and history and story. I want to thank Mark, uh, Alexander Juhas, um, uh, all the people who worked on all my projects, all my collaborators, because I believe in collaboration, all my black academics and queer academics who wrote about me and continue to write about me and teach about me. Uh, I want to thank my family who's here, my wife, Karina, my kids. Um, it just, just, it's, it's a process and not a state. Again, everything is whole. Um, and I also want to thank all the queers and the uh, just all the queers who are resisting and all the people of color who are resisting now um, to create their own future. And um, I think you're the only ones who can have your own power. So, so be it and take your power. And, and thank you again. <laughs> 